Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around Our World on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today, we're looking at significant rights and foreign poly le policy legislation safeguarding human rights in arms exports. Today, we're joining by Sophia. Sophia, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. Aloha, Joss. Thank you for having me. What's so important about this issue that we're talking about is this is really the most significant bill in multiple decades, focusing on human rights and foreign policy, demanding the attention of America and world affairs. Safeguard human rights in arms exports locks the rule of law considerations into existing legal framework of arms exports, controls, and sets practical procedures for implementation and continuing review. Sophia, can you share why is this issue so important in international human rights law? Thank you, Josh. Yes. Uh, as you said, this bill is incredibly important and uh, this issue broadly, more broadly uh, is incredibly important for human rights around the world. Uh, the United States is uh, one of the largest uh, exporters and providers of weapons and uh, other military equipment around the world. Uh, and those weapons can be used in the commission of human rights violations and abuses. It's imperative that the United States uh, take responsibility uh, for its role uh, in uh, these conditions around the world and take every possible measure to ensure that it doesn't uh, become complicit uh, in the perpetuation of human rights abuses and violations. One of the reasons uh, why this uh, bill is so important is because it uh, enshrines into law uh, protections that are uh, currently only a matter of policy. It also expands existing uh, statutory authorities uh, to ensure that not only uh, are uh, weapons in the form of direct assistance, but also sales are subject to uh, scrutiny for uh, human rights violations and abuses around the world. It's really crucial and it's so exciting for you to be able to explain this important legislation can you share with us a bit about the legislation, what Senate number and what House number it is and, and where it's at right now in today's world? Sure. Uh, so uh, some of the some of the reasons, uh, uh, some of the specific provisions, uh, Josh, that uh, are really important uh, for within this bill include an expansion of existing uh, Leahy restrictions. These are two laws that affect the State Department and the Defense Department, and they require uh, that. Uh, uh, we not provide uh, assistance, uh, direct military aid uh, to police and military units abroad that have a record of gross violations of human rights uh, that have gone unaddressed. Um, however, uh, those two laws only apply to direct assistance and not to sales. So the Safeguard Act, if, imp uh, if enacted, would uh, apply the same uh, restrictions to sales as well as assistance. It would also improve uh, what's referred to as end-use monitoring. End-use monitoring uh, is an existing process, but it's uh, inaccurately named in that it tracks uh, the location and possession of U.S. Uh, weapons and military equipment, but not actually their use. And so the Safeguard Act would actually require the U.S. government to track human rights abuses committed with such equipment and weapons overseas. In addition, and I mentioned this a, a little bit uh, earlier, uh, the Safeguard Act would enshrine into law certain uh, aspects of the Biden administration's current conventional arms transfer policy, or the CAP policy for short, uh, uh, which require uh, the U.S. government to consider uh, international humanitarian law uh, and international human rights law considerations. And finally, uh, and perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, the act would, uh, would increase congressional oversight by requiring periodic reporting uh, to Congress uh, and also uh, require that 
uh, at any threshold, um, at any dollar value, uh, any uh, arms sales uh, or uh, assistance to uh, foreign entities with a record of uh, international humanitarian law violations, gross violations of human rights, genocide, and, and, and war crimes. So the important to understand all those elements and why the Safeguard Act is so important. We know that in the Senate, it's known as S 1025 and it's HR 1801 in the House. And it's so important to see how this humanitarian law considerations can be put into law and how we enshrine human rights going forward. What first inspired you to care about this issue and get involved in campaigning? Thanks, Josh. So uh, uh, I worked with uh, Amnesty International f uh, as a member of staff for seven years. And during that time, I had the opportunity to work on a range of international human rights issues. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the truths uh, that was uh, that was evident throughout that time uh, was that uh, the United States, unfortunately, has a role uh, in uh, international human rights violations and abuses around the world through a variety of uh, means uh, and, and causes, um, one of those being uh, the provision of, of weapons and military equipment uh, to actors who have shown that they cannot be trusted not to commit such violations and abuses. And uh, this is why it was incredibly important uh, to me uh, to um, contribute however I could to um, this fight for the greater realization of uh, human rights around the world. Amnesty International has uh, documented in many countries all over the world uh, the, uh, the fact that U.S. weapons have been and are being used uh, to commit human rights violations and abuses. No, and it's so important being an amnesty member, right? It's that motto of it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness and and also the inspiration that one individual can really make a difference. We see Peter Benison creating amnesty while reading the newspaper and complaining about what's happening in another country. But then that aspect that we can all write a letter, that we can all share a sense of solidarity and that through coming together, in this case as AIUSA, we can have an impact on national legislation, which then ripples around the world and guarantees really a culture of human rights and rule of law that will then help many people around the planet. Absolutely. When we're looking at amnesty and when you start sharing that aspect about the impact around the world, it reminds me of the, the time I was lobbying and when we met Senator Schatz, who was actually a co-sponsor of the Safeguard Act, then Sasha was with us from U Amnesty UK, and he was able to also say that really U.S. taking a lead on this would then encourage the United Kingdom to follow and then really set up a new standard heading in the right direction when we look at what's so important around arms and, and what we can do more to make sure that human rights violations do not take place and impact innocent people around the planet. I couldn't agree more, Josh. And I will say uh, that is, I think, one of the most unique, unique aspects of Amnesty International's contribution to the global movement for human rights. Amnesty International, of course, is the world's largest grassroots human rights organization. And this uh, is a, a, a value added that uh, many other organizations are not able to bring to bear. The fact that uh, people all over the world uh, in the United States and elsewhere uh, who have uh, all kinds of jobs and ways of spending their time uh, come together uh, and uh, express, uh, advocate fearlessly uh, for the human rights of both themselves and everyone around the world is incredibly important and impactful. And our leaders, I think, especially in uh, the United States, really need to hear from all of us. You know, it's not just about, you know, uh, subject matter experts and PhDs who sit in white towers. It's uh, it's about everyone. And it's, uh, it's about all of us letting uh, our leaders know that we are paying attention and that we do care and that uh, we demand uh, greater respect and realization of human rights here and, and abroad. It's true. The way you mentioned just really brings back the memories of 
being there the evening before, connecting with fellow Amnesty, passionate uh, volunteers around the country, meeting with people who have been working on this issue for decades. You know, you really see it that someone has been a policy person pointing this out, and all of a sudden then they see in a way that sea of humanity coming together to support what only they thought was important or a smaller group. And I loved how you put it that it's not just PhDs. It's not a job. It's a joy for people to come together and to have an impact to be able to really shape our policy. And as we're all standing the next day, then on the stairs, it was so exciting to see everyone energized, leaving those steps. Uh, there was that speech by AIUSA uh, president. You could see the executive director, Paul, sharing his vision, talking about this is really what democracy looks like and why we're all involved. And on this important year where, of course, half of the world will vote and cast their ballot, it was really showing the power of the ballot and what voting rights mean and what we can all do to make a difference to change the direction of our country, but also make sure that the world also remembers that spirit of 1948, remembers why human rights are so crucial in domestic affairs, but also uh, foreign policy too. I couldn't agree more, Josh. Uh, it's uh, It was a beautiful day. Uh, the sun was shining. It was, uh, as I used to say, it was a beautiful day to, to fight for human rights. Um, and uh, I, I know that we had uh, more than 100 folks um, from all over the country meeting with representatives who uh, who serve uh, communities uh, across the 50 United States. And uh, I, I know that in some of the meetings that I was able to sit in and participate in, uh, we certainly uh, uh, encountered, uh, you know, a real uh, sort of refreshed energy and uh, an appreciation for hearing from uh, the constituents who care about human rights, uh, as opposed to, you know, um, career lobbyists uh, who may represent, you know, uh, more powerful or moneyed interests. Um, uh, you know, on maybe on the other side of some of the issues that we work on, um, they uh, the the offices uh, wanted to were happy to know that their constituents uh, care about the United States and its role in protecting human rights around the world. It is true. It's you really see Article Twenty that peaceful assembly and association, and also also Article Twenty One, the right to participate in government and free elections. You could really see and feel it in the air when you see everybody getting excited. And so that's really good as we look going forward. One aspect when I thought about the Safeguard Act and really connecting you know, security and human rights, we're trying to explain what this is. I like that example of like a bartender who serves an inebriated customer. You know, Governments who are supplying weapons abroad have a secondary responsibility to ensure that they're not used to violate human rights or commit war crimes. Could you maybe expand on that a bit? Certainly. So as I shared before, you know, uh, the United States um, pr uh, manufactures uh, and exports weapons at a rate that is um, that far outpaces um, most others in the world. And um, we have ongoing uh, security relationships with many countries around the world. And those relationships are valuable uh, to, to those entities uh, abroad. Uh, now, what's important there is that uh, the United States um, takes responsibility for the devastating impact that these weapons and, and equipment can have. Um, I mean, the you know many of these items are inherently dangerous, and so it's it's critical that the United States take every possible um, step to ensure that um, these uh, this equipment and and what the and these weapons are handled responsibly. Now, unfortunately, uh, despite um, really critical protections that are that currently exist in the law, there are serious gaps, and we know that because Amnesty International has documented uh, again and again in countries around the world with whom the United States has had long-term relationships, and. Uh, 
the use of these weapons and human rights abuses and violations. And so you would think that the United States would uh, be able to exert its influence for um, for the greater good and for the respect of human rights. And unfortunately, um, there are many places and many times in which the United States is and has fallen short. And so again, it's just uh, it's it's critically important that we uh, bolster the protections that we have currently with uh, new and updated and and frankly better uh, measures uh, moving forward. And as you mentioned that, it did get me thinking. There are a couple examples maybe that we could look at. We could see what happens in Colombia, maybe what happens in Yemen or also Nigeria, maybe we could share some examples that brings the words on these pages to life of why this is so important and how human rights can be respected, protected, and fulfilled, but also lives can be saved. Yes. So uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of uh, important cases. Uh, these are, you know, these are recent cases. Uh, in Yemen, uh, Amnesty International identified uh, U.S.-made munitions that caused the death of uh, of, of dozens of people, uh, in addition to uh, many uh, children. Um, one family uh, lost every child uh, in their family, but one, uh, and. It's uh, it's it's devastating. Uh, these the impact that uh, these weapons, when not used responsibly and and correctly, can have um, on on people who you know just want to live their lives like you and me. In Colombia, uh, in response to uh, peaceful labor organizing, the government used United States produced uh, tear gas and other equipment to violently suppress peaceful protests, resulting in all kinds of horrific injuries, uh, up to and including death. Uh, folks, uh, folks have lost their eyes, folks have experienced horrific injuries um, that happened using U.S. equipment. Uh, in Nigeria, Amnesty International has documented uh, a whole host of uh, in incredibly serious human rights violations and abuses by both state and non-state actors. But uh, with uh, regard to United States equipment, uh, there was uh, a clear um, doc. Uh, there was clear documentation of a case in which. Uh, a United States uh, uh, manufactured helicopter was used in the violent uh, suppression of peaceful protests uh, by the Nigerian government. And that's these are only instances where Amnesty International was able to uh, was able to verify the use of U.S. equipment in particular uh, incidents of human rights abuses and violations. The human rights abuses by each of those three governments, uh, uh, the violations by each of those three governments are so much beyond just these incidents. Uh, they are widespread, they are repetitive, and uh, often they happen with impunity. And as you mentioned, it, it really does make me think about those stories, right? The, the, the one child who said they have no one to play with anymore. When you look at the Yemen example, that they used to have such a full family. And then now that's the only child due to this issue not being enforced and what happened there. And it also brings up what I remember lobbying and going around. We went with a student who created the first amnesty chapter on her college campus. And she told the story about how this student in Colombia was majoring in pretty much the same issue she was. And that here she's able to organize create a chapter, do activities, but there in Colombia that this young woman lost her eye doing the exact same thing that she does here. So we could really see that sense of solidarity between people across borders, understanding that really our language, our common language is human rights, compassion, courage, and creative ways to have campaigns that make a difference for all of us in the world. When you were able to lobby, are there any exciting stories or aspects of lobbying that that jump out at you and what were you able to do when you returned home to be able to share this experience with others well uh i will say that 
you know, uh, being able to uh, show up in person and uh, communicate with uh, another human being face to face to really tell the story of why uh, these, uh, why provisions uh, like those in the Safeguard Act are, are so important for protecting real people around the world and why we here care so deeply about doing that. Uh, I think is is very impactful, and you know it's uh, it's that human connection, and it goes beyond words on a page. Although our letters are important, uh, and in, although our our sharing uh, our words um, through social media and through other means are important, uh, that human connection I think really drives home for folks that we care about this. It is important, and uh, we uh, will continue to care about this moving forward. It's not just one election cycle or one uh, term uh, in Congress. Another uh, another takeaway uh, I have is that uh, there is seemingly uh, broad support for uh, you know improving the United States. Uh, way of showing up in the world uh, and in ensuring that you know we're not contributing to human rights abuses and violations around the world. Most of the meetings that I was able to be a part of, and I heard the same from many other amnesty lobbyists, were, were really productive and engaged. Uh, I also think um, that uh, it, it underscored uh, the importance of, of two aspects of, of amnesty's co contribution to uh, the human rights movement. First, our people power. We, you know, as I said, we had more than a hundred people out meeting with uh, congressional offices representing communities across the country, uh, and I think uh, that uh, can do those constituents speaking to their leaders, speaking to the rep their representatives, uh, is is incredibly important. I also heard uh, in those uh, meetings uh, a desire for more information. Uh, that's really important, uh, and it's really uh, fortunate because. Amnesty International has a wealth of information, has been documenting uh, human rights violations and abuses, including those using U.S. equipment around the world for a very long time. And so I was uh, really uh, encouraged uh, to hear from some offices, hey, you know, we'd like to read more about this. You know, can you share more of the legal analysis and more of the documentation that um, that you all have? Um, and uh, I, I will say uh, after returning home, uh, being able to share that experience with other people who are constituents of some of the leaders that I met with, uh, some of the representatives that I met with, uh, it sort of ignited uh, a um, renewed uh, sort of passion for engagement among those who weren't able to come with me to D.C. It's true. You could see it on our faces as we left. I'll never forget. I arrived back here in Hawaii and this young girl saw my bag and it said, I lobby for human rights. And she goes, mom, what does that mean? And I gave her a sticker and actually the bookmark. And the mom was great to explain that it's about each citizen standing up for positive social change and making sure that their voice is heard. And in this case, she was like, well, what are rights? And it was so good that just even that tote bag can start that conversation. And as well, when I shared all the different amnesty information, especially that button. The button says vote like our human rights depend on it. I think that was a part that was also raised at the annual general meeting where it was that we're building a culture of human rights, that it's really growing a movement. And it's not just the one election in 2024 and the presidential, but it's at every level, at the municipal, at the city hall, at then the state capitol, and then in the US Congress, and then as well, all the way up the ballot box to, of course, the White House. And it really does show, though, how at each level we can all contribute and make a difference. And with the Safeguard Act, it was so exciting for us to say that the U.S. government must not approve weapons transfers and exports that will be used to commit human rights abuses or violate international humanitarian law. That once again, the U.S. would lead in a positive way and differentiate itself from authoritarian regimes. And that Congress, of course, can play that vital role to enshrine human rights protection in arms exports law. And that the members of our Congress, as we asked them to, could co-sponsor the bill, 
push for markups, advocate for the inclusion of provisions in the must-pass appropriations and authorization bills. And that's, of course, important where members from Hawaii sit on those important staff. And that's what's so crucial. What do you see that we can all do going forward for the Safeguard Act and for human rights to make the U.S. a better place? Before I answer your question, Josh, I do uh, just want to uh, pick up on one thing you shared, you know, that conversation that you had when you returned uh, home to Hawaii and uh, had that discussion about, well, what are rights? What are human rights? Uh, and and shared that, um, that interaction. You know, I, I think uh, in this time where, uh, where frankly, uh, United States law and policy and United States interpretations of constitutional law are, uh, frankly, inadequate to uh, uh, preserve and protect uh, our human rights here in the United States. I think it's ever more important uh, for people to be able to access human rights frameworks as uh, an aspirational and uh, essential uh, means of, you know, uh, living a, a, a free and fair life um, wherever you are from. Uh, international human rights frameworks um, provide much higher standards when it comes to how governments treat us uh, uh, than the United St than U.S. laws often do. Uh, now, to, to turn back to your question, moving forward, what we can all do, I think, is share with our communities and share with our representatives uh, our conviction uh, and commitment to human rights and demand that they reflect that commitment as well. Very important. And you know, as we look at this in conclusion, weapons in the hands of security forces can easily become instruments of human rights abuses. And in times of armed conflict, convention, military weapons cause harms and deaths to many civilians, unfortunately. And this bill would overhaul the arms sales law to center human rights by ensuring U.S. weapons around the world pushes for accountability and enhancing congressional oversight on arms sales. And we really want to thank you for sharing just one example of people power coming together from our communities to then make sure that our Congress represents the values and also the visions of what we care about. And as, of course, we look at the 75th commemoration of the UDHR, we, of course, look at Article 2021 today to see what's possible. But it's important that we see the interconnection of all of those articles and all of those rights. And one last point that you raised really inspired me because we do have to understand that no country is immune to really populism and seeing a potential retreat in human rights. And that's why when Eleanor Roosevelt was chairing the Commission on Human Rights to create this Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the subsequent nine treaties, it's to make sure that if any country stumbles, there's still a global standard that we don't allow ourselves to fall below and that we all can utilize these human rights weapons to help ourselves in our countries to make sure our country can be everything that we desire for it to be in this democracy, for global diplomacy, and for a world that guarantees equality and equity for all. Well said, Josh. Mahalo. I really thank you so much for joining us today, and we appreciate all the work that you do and look forward to continuing these important dialogues and discussions for a better human rights in our world. Thank you so much for joining us. Aloha.